Chapter 7, Part 6, The Cross and the Crescent Moon with a Star The crescent moon with a star is an old symbol of Zagrad. It owes its origin to the blaze of the star of Bethlehem and to the solar eclipse, which was associated with the nativity of Christ and the crucifixion of Andronicus Christ. Today, the crescent moon with a star is perceived exclusively as a Muslim symbol. However, up until the end of the 17th century, a crescent moon with a star adorned, for example, the spire of the huge Christian saint Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, the crescent moon was removed from the spire and replaced with a cross. Only in 1685, a star inscribed into a crescent moon was a form of the Christ, uh, Christian cross. A cross in the shape of a star, eight or six-pointed, for example, is known in medieval iconography. Such images of the cross's stars can be seen on the walls of the famous St. Sophia Cathedral of Kiev. It turns out that the cross, uh, that a cross with a crescent moon on the domes of the Russian cathedrals and a Turkish crescent moon with a star symbolizing a cross are just the various forms of the same Christian symbol. The universal symbol of the great empire acquired a slightly different form in Russia and Turkey. When, in, when the empire fragmented into the 17th century, the Christian cross remained with the Christians and the Christian crescent moon with a star. With the Muslims, the Christian six-pointed star with the Jews. Is there a crescent moon uh, present in the old Russian coat of arms, for example, in the coat of arms of the Russian cities? Many readers would probably think that nothing of this of the kind existed in Russia, as today it is very rarely that one might see uh, such a, a Russian coat of arms. Nevertheless, let us open a fundamental edition dedicated to the coats of arms of Russian cities entered into the complete body of laws of the Russian Empire from 1649 to 1900. Book 162 for each coat of arms indicated in the date of it being established, the majority of the dates refer to the 17th to the 19th CC. However, reportedly, the majority of the coats of arms date back to an earlier age. It appears that an old coat of, coats of arms of the Russian cities, the symbol of the crescent moon with a cross, a star was pr present, notably very vividly expressed. For example, the coats of arms of several cities in the Chernigov uh, region consists of a large crescent moon with a uh, cross inserted in it. Sometimes there is a star placed near a cross. There are quite a few such examples. We counted at least 29 coats of arms. Uh, the crosses with the crescent moon, uh, the crescent moon with a star cross, uh, for ex uh, example, high on the dome of the Moscow Kremlin. Now the presence of numerous crescent moons with a cross star on the domes of the Christian churches becomes clear. Part 7, the double-headed eagle and the crescent moon with a star cross. Why did a double two-headed eagle become the symbol of the empire? After all, the two-headed creatures very rarely occur in nature except as an anomaly. 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 Uh, it is clear that the symbol of the imperial two-headed eagle was determined by some reason far removed from the study of nature. Let us refer to the exceptional and fascinating engraving by Albert Duer, uh, comprising his famous Ark of Maximilian I, known as uh, Erenf Erenforte. Uh, in figure 78, there is a presented one of the coats of arms of Durer's Erenforte. It is perfectly clear that here is depicted a crescent moon with rays emanating from it. At the same time, it is apparent that these are the upturned wings of an eagle. The rays are the feathers of a bird. There is no head of an eagle here. So, the two-headed eagle most likely symbolizes the crescent moon with a star or, or the crescent moon with a cross, which is the same thing. As a star was often depicted in the form of a cross, the two heads of the eagles looking in opposite direction is one of the forms of the cross star cross resting on the crescent wings of the eagle figure 79 and figure 80 c the two-headed eagle of the wings raised upwards is one of the forms of the christian cross a or six ended aka will repeat the ottoman crescent moon with a star part a the arrow 
Arabic inscriptions on Russian weaponry. Before the end of the 16th century, Russia, Ottoman Empire, and Persia were all part of the single horde empire. That is why there surely must have existed common cultural traditions, in particular similar weaponry, production, and ornamentation techniques. Uh, despite the emerging religious split between Christianity and Islam in, in the 16th century, the state and military tradition of the 16th to the 17th CC must have still been very close. Sure enough, up until the middle of the 17th century, uh, already in the epic of the Romanovs, the Russian craftsmen still decorated the weapons, even the royal ones, the Arabic inscriptions. It was only in the second half of the 17th century they were pr probably told that they were no longer allowed to do so after the Russian weapons with Arabic ins inscriptions appeared. However, Russian royal weaponry with Arabic ins inscriptions em emblazoned with gold, <clears throat> emblazoned with gold, uh, diamonds, and other precious stones produced by the best craftsmen of the armory chamber were preserved in view of its material value, but most of the Russian Arabic weaponry were moved to the storerooms. But today, when all of this is forgotten, some of this dangerous weaponry is displayed in the mu museums, for instance, in the Kremlin armory chamber. Here, for example, is the ceremonial hem helmet of the Moscow Tsars made of Damascus, Damascus scene steel called Jericho cap, state helmet. Yariko cap, uh, however, in order to see the Arabic inscription on the Russian weaponry, you have to be very attentive as the explanatory um, explanatory signs don't say anything about such improper engravings and the in exhibits are often displayed in such a way that the Arabic engravings are barely discernible. Weapons with the Arabic inscriptions were being forged not only and quite possibly not as much in Turkey, in the Christian Russia up until the middle of the 17th century. They liked to ornament the weaponry with the Arabic script, the saber of Prince Mitslavsky, who was Ivan the Terrible's commander, was adorned with Arabic aphorisms. One of the aphorisms goes, there will be strong protection in the battle. There is also a Russian inscription on the saber stating the identity of the owner. So why today are the Russian weaponry with the Arabic inscriptions always attributed to a non-Russian origin, usually Turkish or Persian? In those cases, with the Russian work is completely obvious. It is considered that the experienced and ignorant Russian craftsmen copy the wonderful Eastern and Western pieces in an apprentice-like fashion, alleging that they mechanically transferred them like some beautiful pictures onto the magnificent weapons of the Russian czar and commanders without understanding their meaning. And they proudly wore and showed off those strange aphorisms which were incomprehensible to them, accompanied by the reserve and incredulous smiles of the learned Arabs and even more learned Europeans. This is not true. In the epic of the 16th and uh, even the 17th CC, a great many of the Russian horde weaponry with the Arabic engravings were produced, it seems, in Russia horde, which in the 15th to the 16th CC constituted a whole with, a, with the Ottoman Empire Ottomania. Later, a considerable part of the weaponry made in Moscow, Tula, Urals, and the Russian reference in general were cunningly declared to be either the Messine or Eastern or Western in an opinion form that allegedly in that epic, the Russians carried many foreign weapons as purportedly there were very, very little homemade weapons and they were of poor quality. Though it is obvious that any military power fought using its homegrown weaponry that said, they forgot that medieval Damascus was to Moscow. The name of Moscow with the def, uh, definite article T denoting respect. They also made weaponry with Latin inscriptions in Russia, or at least they used the Latin letters as, for example, the previous Damask steel saber made by Russian craftsman Ilya Prosvit in 1618. The historians reassure us that the Arabic inscriptions are present on the old Russian weapons only because they were presented as the gifts to the Russian czars and the Russian warriors by foreigners who wrote in Arabic. This explanation is incorrect. Moreover, it appears that the Russian czars themselves presented the foreigners with the gifts of weaponry adorned with Arabic inscriptions. 
Everything uh, said about the Arabic inscriptions on the Russian weaponry does not only refer to the Kremlin armory chamber, for example, in the M Muslim Museum of Alexandrovskaya Slovoda, the modern town of Alexandrov in the Raspiatskaya, the crucifixion church belfry there is exhibited the army of a russian warrior chain mail a shield a helmet the museum sign inform us that this is russian armor indeed entire helmet is covered with a depiction of exotic animals horsemen birds carried out in the russian style reminiscent of the famous engravings of the walls of the white stone cathedrals of vladimir vladimir and suzdal russia the nose guard of the helmet ends above with a four-ended cross all of this unmistakably points to the Russian origin of the helmet. At the same time, there is a clear wide band inscription of Arabic running around it. Next to the helmet, there is the shield. Once again, there is a wide band inscription in Arabic running along the edge of the shield. And this is a Russian shield. The same sort of thing is in Moscow Museum Reserve, Kolomenskoye, there are exhibited two old Russian military helmets. Both of them have the inscription in Arabic and only in Arabic and so on. So on the Russian medieval weapons, the inscription survived, which today are preserved as Arabic. Should you pay attention to it just once, you immediately begin to stumble across such examples at every step. This astonishing fact does not fit into the traditional version of the Romanov history. Just this one fact is enough to understand that the history of Russia of the pre-Romanov epoch was completely different than it is presented to us today. Part 9. Even the, in the 17th century, the Russian texts were sometimes written with Arabic letters. Even in the 17th CC, the Russia, they still use a variety of alphabets to write down the Russian texts. The perfect example is the, um, uh, the traveling notes kept by Paul of uh, El Pepo, Paul Arcadian and of El Pepo, the talented ecclesiastical writers of the mid-17th century who accompanied his father everywhere. Patriarch Mark Serio of Serd of Antioch in 1656, the patriarch visited Russia for the first time and was in Moscow. On the invitation of Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, the prim primate of the Antioch church, he visited the Savino Sto Storozhensky's monastery. When accompanying the patriarch Paul the Al have made detailed notes, the trip report of a kind. Maybe such were the rules of the patriarchy at that time. The notes survived to our day and considered as remarkably valuable testimonies of the epic of Alexe Alexei Mikhailovich. The question is, what language was the text written in? For our contemporaries brought up on the Scaligerian Romanov history, the answer would seem to be obvious. Dumb. One must oppose the Orthodox Christian Paul of Aleppo, the son of the Orthodox Christian Patriarch of Antioch, who arrived to Orthodox Christian Russia to visit Orthodox Christian Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, would write his report either in Russian or in Greek. At the very least in Latin, which admittedly would have been odd, but apparently the accounts are written in Arabic. Further on, it becomes even more intriguing. The Orthodox author of the 17th century freely alternates between Arabic and Russian. But at the same time, he writes down a Russian text with Arabic letters. Thus, it is unexpectedly becomes clear that the epic of Alexei Mikhailovich's, a Russian text, could have easily been written down in Russian, but using Arabic letters. The very fact that Paul Aleppo's accounts written in Arabic and Russian but using Arabic letters survive means that it was carefully preserved as an important official document. But today we are assured that the writings of such documents in Arabic must definitely indicate their Muslim origin. At the same time, the Antioch Patriarchy was considered one of the most important centers of the Orthodox Church. We can see that in the 17th century, the picture was different from the way it is presented to us today. Another example is the famous writing, The Journey Beyond Three Seas, Klozenye Zatri Moria by Avsanze Nikitan, 
the text was written by an Orthodox Christian. The journey was mainly written in Russian. However, from time to time, Afeni Nik, Lik, Nik Ki Tin freely and fluently changed into Turkic and even Arabic languages. Then, in the usually flowing way, he changes back to the Russian language. It is obvious that he himself, as do his readers, know several languages, but this is not the main thing. The main thing is this. Main thing, this is that the Turkic and Arabic languages are used by Alfense Nikitin for the Russian Orthodox Christian prayers, or if you will, for the Islamic Orthodox Christian prayers. However, strange, this combination of words may sound in our times. Part 10, the Russian bilingual coins, apparently in the heads side of the Russian coin of the 14th century, there is always a copy from the Tatar coin on the riverside of these coins. There is always an inscription, the Grand Princess Seal, the Princess Seal, and the image of the ceiling wax itself, possibly soon after they started adding the name of a Grand Prince. Hence, it is necessary to conclude that all the first Russian coins had two names on them. The numismatic historians call these coins double-named i.e. on one side there is a name of Tartar Khan and the other of a Russian prince. It's true enough that allegedly due to their Ill illiteracy, the Russian money makers often put down the name of a wrong Khan. Our explanation is simple. All of these coins are not double named, but bilingual, meaning that on the coins there was printed a name of one ruler who was simultaneously a Khan and a Grand Prince, but it was written in two languages, Russian and Tatar. Part 11, the Horde Empire broke up. In 1610 to 1632, strife lasted for three years. The change of dynasties takes place. Mikhail Romanov mounts the throne in 1613 to 1645. The very name of the new dynasty, the Romanovs, probably meant that meant at that point new Rome. It is likely the new rulers tried to emphasize the difference of the Rome old, i.e. from the Russian horde empire of the 14th to the 16th CC. In Western Europe, the former Mongol governors who had split off from the metropoli enter a fierce battle for lands and dominance. Wars break out, which today are known to us as the Reformation Wars during this epoch. Instead of the previous point of view, all the lands in the one and undivided empire belong to the Tsar Khan and are divided by them. A new chronology of the split emerges. This is our territory. We are the masters here and we and do not take orders from anyone. We are better than the others. We have lived here before you, so return these lands to us. Our achievements are better than yours. Our ships are better than yours. Our science is better than yours. We are sophisticated. You are ignorant. The new unscrupulous ideology of the reformers was reflected in the cynical book, The Prince, attributed to Mikhailovich, Machiavelli, uh, frenzied uh, a criminalist, a criminalist, uh, carved up the territories of the legacy of the great empire, stretched on for decades. Rivers of blood were spilt. Today, the true reason for the carve up fight is forgotten. The historians bring the entire matter down to allegedly alleged in religious squabbling. The network of the Mongol fortifications, which for a long time provided stability and order in the empire, is destroyed. Primarily, the reformers struck the blow on the Cathar, Scythian castles of the West Europe and on the Crusader castle, fortification of the Middle East in Syria, etc. They preferred to destroy the former mil mighty military fortifications in the imperial provinces, seeding with revolt, fearing that in a few days they might fall in the hands of their uh, enemies once again. The mighty Hordian castles were blown up with gunpowder. Part 12, the annihilation of the Cathar Scythians. The struggle of the Reformation of the 16, 15, 16 to the 17th CC with the splinters of the Horde Empire is very well illustrated in by the annihilation of the Cathars in France. The history of the Cathars is one of the most breath, breathtaking and mysterious chapters of the Middle Ages. Allegedly in the 10th to the 11th CC, the Western Europe, and in particular in France, there emerged a new Christian movement, the supporters of which became known as the Cathars or Cathari and also the El Albigenes or Albigios. Uh, it is thought that the region of the Cathar was Christian. However, it differs from the Orthodox Christianity and Catholicism of today it, in its detail. It, is, it was declared to be heretical.
It is widely thought that the Cathar heresy widely spread and met with the opposition from the Catholic Church. In the first half of the allegedly of the 13th century, the Crusades were organized against the Cathars. They fought back tooth and claw, but they were defeated. Their mighty fortresses were destroyed, allegedly since the 14th CC. They uh, exit the stage. However, up until now, south of France is uh, called Cathar country. Very little remains from them today, but whatever is left is very impressive. In the first place, the mighty castle fortresses in the cities on top of mountains and cliffs, which control the trade and military routes, the magnificent fortification received the name of the Cathar castles. As we demonstrate in uh, 6v2, chapter 1, the Cathars are the Scythians of the Volga River who came to France in the 14th century. From Russia whore during the Mongol conquest that settled down here and as colonizers defeated, created the ruling class. The religion was Christian. In the epoch of the empire of the 14th to the 16th CC, the Cathars, Scythians, having partially mixed with the local population, created a unique culture, built the cities, cathedrals, fortresses, some of which are still called Cathar. In the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th, CC, during the revolt of the Reformation of the West Europe, the Cathar Scythians were defeated in a grueling war. Later, they, they story, their story was transported from the 14th to the 16th CC into the 11th to the 13th CC. In addition, it was declared that the Cathar Scythian Gothic cathedrals, uh, starting as early as the 13th CC, uh, the, from the very start of the construction, allegedly were genuine Catholic. In its later Reformation sense. This was a falsification. The Bulgarian, Volga, Orthodox, Christian region of the Cathar Scythian was proclaimed to be heresy. The dramatic events of the history of the Cathar Scythians found their way onto the pages of the Bible. For example, the story of Count Simon Osman de Montfort, uh, Earl of Leicester, aka Ancient Piraeus, under the name of Abimelech is briefly described in the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 9. Various ancient authors of the 16th, 17th CC gave their account of it. For example, Plutarch. Plutarch, some of the uh, empire's provinces, resisted the split and tried to restore the former unity. Siberia, the Far East, and part of the North America were governed by the Horde up until the middle of the 17th century. In the West, the conservative imperial climate was particularly strong in Spain and England. In the East and South, where there was no rebellion, the former imperial regions took up an antagonistic position towards the West and the pro-Western Romanovs, we mean Siberia, Far East, America, China, Japan, Turkey, Egypt, Iran, and Hindustan. 13. The rebels strive to prevent the resurrection of the Great Empire. Aiming to establish their rights to the territory seized by and divided between themselves, the usurper rebels in Europe and the Romanovs in Russia rewrite history. The great empire is wiped off the pages of the Chronicles. The adulterated Scaligerian chronology is being created, making the dates of a great number of events artificial order. Joseph Scaliger, 1542-1609, and Dionysius Petivius of 1583-1652 are considered to be its creators, though it is not very clear if, in fact, they were the authors of the works attributed to them or their names were cunningly made of use, creating a self-serving version of history. The new authorities strive to prove their allegedly ancient origins and non-existent alleged uh, her hereditary her hereditary rights to the throne, a great many newly minted crowns which were declared independent from time immor immemorial, appeared in the 17th CC on the ruins of the empire in France, Germany, Italy, England, etc. They were in conflict with each other for a long time. The theory of the Indo-European languages originating from the distant India occupied an important place in the Scaligerian history, where India is perceived in the modern sense as a country situated on the Hindustan Peninsula. The Indian subcontinent, it is considered that the proto-languages originated here and permeate many countries, we do not see any reason for objections except one. Where was that ancient India situated in reality? Where did the Indo-European languages originate from and when? According to our results, it is Russia horde of the 
14 to the 16 CC, the reformists quickly invent and energetic, energetically introduce the new languages uh, based on former imperial states, uh, church, Slavonic language, and the local di dialects in the provinces which acquired their independence. For example, French, German, Spanish, English, and also ancient Latin and ancient Greek. This allowed the rebels to build language barriers between the populations of newly formed states. Their purpose is clear, to destroy the unity between the nations of the empire. In the face of newly established religious and linguistic barriers, former bonds begin to break. It is all described in the Bible as the confusion of tongues, followed the Babel pandemonium. The invention of new languages allowed the reformists to speed up the progress process of casting into oblivion the memory of the great empire to prevent its restoration. But as these new languages inevitably incorporated a significant layer from the former imperial state Slavonic language, the numerous Slavonic traces can be found in them even today. The process of the dissemination of languages was also spurred on by the state activities. The settled imperial governors begin to introduce the alphabets into their territories, change grammar, invent new fonts, vowel making, new reading rules. For example, in some places they introduce the way of reading, not the way it is spelled. A great example of this is French. Let's say it is spelled F-O-I-X, the name of Cathar City, a town not far from Toulouse, pronounced Foi. They strive to distance themselves as soon as possible from the Slavonic language and Slavonic writing. In schools, they introduce the study of the recently invented languages, and in a generation or two, the old language and writing were forgotten by the majority of the population. The old books written in Slavonic language with, a, with the old characters became incomprehensible. Not being reproduced, they gradually uh, became obsolete. In the West, things were happening particularly fast as this process was brought to the level of a national program. The Index of Forbidden Books was introduced. Previous history uh, books, writing, and also heretic were thrown on the fire. In the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th CZ, the formerly united Christianity began to splinter into several branches including via the efforts of the reformists. In time, there formed separate religions, Orthodox Christianity, Catholicism, Protestantism, Protestantism, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, etc. The former unity was forgotten and in some cases gave way to feuding. This was quite convenient for the usurpers who came to power in order to keep hold of the recently created and still unstable uh, local thrones they strive to split the previously united population of the empire into antagonistic groups. The subjects were deceived by pointing at the neighboring people and being told that they we were always different. We always spoke different language. We always had different faith. We never married Gentiles. We never took adherence from of different faith as our wives, all of which was untrue. In the 17 to 18 CC, in place of the former imperial idea of the world united under the sole supreme power with a limited power in place as at the local level. A new principle was introduced. In my own state, I rule as I will. In the in the time of the empire, on the contrary, there always existed a possibility that the supreme Karzan arrived arrives and the governors would have to answer for their actions. This curbed the arbitrary actions of the local authorities in place, which wasn't very popular with some of the imperial officials, thus the grounds for the reformation were created. 14. How the Romanovs destroyed the history of the Horde the cathedral and the archangel of the Moscow Kremlin could have told us a lot of things about the old Russian history as it was declared to be the official burial vault of the Russian grand princes and czars, including the first Romanovs. Today, there are approximately 50 tombs in the cathedral. It is thought that here were buried all the Moscow and grand dukes, beginning with the Ivan Kalita. However, these tombs, which today can be seen in the cathedrals, are the brick tombstones made in the 17th century under the first Romanovs. At the time when the first old frescoes were removed from the cathedral walls and vaults and new ones were painted in their place, it is thought that burials were made in white stone sarcophaguses. 
which were lowered into the ground under the floor in the first half of the 17th century. At the burial site, they erected brick tombstones which, with white stone slab ornaments ornamented with Slavonic inscriptions. At the beginning of the 20th century, the tombstones were placed in glazed cases made of bronze. Thus, the old tombstone slab beneath which were uh, there were supposed to be burial sites were bricked up. At the same time, they assured us that the inscriptions on the old slabs were reproduced precisely on the brick tombstone made by the Romanovs. Unfortunately, this is very difficult to verify this. To do so would require dismantling the massive modern constructions. It is only natural to question the authenticity of these royal burials. After the fact, we have learnt about the barbaric destruction of the cathedrals' frescoes by the Romanovs. Today, situated in the basement of the Cathedral of the Archangel, there are also the sarcophaguses of the Russian queen, Tsaritsis, which were moved here in the 20th century from the Kremlin Cemetery, which was destroyed using the construction of the modern building. However, as we have shown in 4v2 Chapter 2, Romanovs in the middle of the 17th century simply either used the anonymous tombs of nuns or... Uh, remove the names from other, some other tomb, then pass them off as the tomb of the Russian queen, they wish to establish some material evidence to support their false version of history. The true burial site of the Russian horde queen were most likely destroyed. This is if the graves were located on the territory of Moscow at all, and not in the royal cemetery in African Egypt. But the Romanovs needed to produce something to demonstrate as proof of the image of Russian history they had painted. And it is in the 17th century the Romanov historian and archaeologist happily discovered allegedly authentic tombs of Yaroslav, the wise, Mudre, um, uh, Mudrai, uh, St. Vladimir, Svazoy, Svayatsoy, uh, they, and their colleagues in Moscow at this very time were working hard on the creation of a presentable royal necropolis in the 11th to the 16th CC in the Archangel Cathedral in the Moscow Kremlin. More specifically, having received the order from above, they were hastily reproducing the old royal burial sites. It has to be said rather carelessly, it seems they simply arrived at the monastery cemetery and decided to turn it into the alleged cemetery of the pre-Romanov queen. The name signs of the nuns were cut off, the tombstones bearing new appropriate signs were placed on top, then they buried under each tombstone an old coffin, but as the coffins were buried, the officers ex executants who were fulfilling this task didn't make those signs very thoroughly. It is worth trying to uh, trying so hard if all of it was to be immediately buried under the ground. In some cases, they together altogether forgot to make a sign on the tomb. In two cases, they have missed, possibly by an oversight, the names of the simple nuns scratched with a nail on the old coffin dust with such audacity there was created a false necropolis of the queens in the Moscow Kremlin. We will repeat that there was no necropolis in Mexico in the pre-Romanov epoch. The Russian hordes, Tsars and Tsarzitsa of the 14th to the 16th CC were transported to African Egypt to be buried in the imperial cemetery. The less distinguished ones were buried in Russia, but having assumed power, the Romanovs did their best to destroy those old sarcophaguses which could have revealed the true story of the pre-Romanov Russia horde. What we are presented with today as antiquity is either the Romanov modern replicas of the poor coffin of common people presented by the Romanov historians as the royal burial sites. Moreover, by the Romanovs, started using the old Russian white stone tomb as building material. This was a clear manifestation of the Romanov's attitude towards Russian history. In, to, in everyday life, builders would hardly go to a cemetery in search for the building materials and take the tombstones for that purpose in order to build an apartment block out of them. Would you want to live in a building like that? Such things were always considered to considered an insult to the memory of the deceased. It did happen sometimes, but exactly as a token of the disrespect towards those who were buried beneath those gravestones, this is amply demonstrated in the Romanov's actions. 
Apparently between 1632 and 1636, they are changed in the type of burial that occurred in Russia. This refers at least to the royal burials. Before 1632, the first Romanov still buried their queen according to the old tradition customary to Russia horde. But then, as we show in 4b2, chapter 2, the Romanovs changed the type of burial. Starting with 1636, they were burying in a different way. So we unexpectedly came across a serious fact. The change in the type of the burial is a major religious social reform. It signifies the fundamental turning point in the life of Russian society in the middle of the 17th century. Surprisingly, nothing is said about this in major this major event in Russian history. Thus, we come across some very same borderline. The 17th century, which separates the falsified history from the more or less accurate one, it is extremely difficult to surmount the, the barrier of the 17th century. Very little true archaeological evidence and written record from earlier than the 17th century survive. In the uh, colonies of the Great Empire in Western Europe, the former imperial cathedrals and constructions were, on the whole, also destroyed. However, the Western reformers who came to power decided to preserve the Gothic uh, ar architectural style of the Mongol empire in their own new buildings, having only declared it to be ancient and exclusively their own, allegedly purely Western European, a shocked wave of the historical rec reconstruction with the total elimination of all traces swept through occupied Russia of the 17th century. Not only the architectural style was changed, but also the very nature of the bur burials. 15. Why the name of the Nogorod taken away from the Yaroslav was moved to the northwest to Lake Iman, Ilmen? As we have already said, the Veliki Nogorod, the chronicles of Yaroslav upon Volga, to be precise, the name of the entire region, including the number of cities Rostov and Suzdal in particular, but in the epic of the 17th century, the name Nogorod was taken away from Yaroslav and given to a small town, a former town district, a small ford in the northwest of Russia by Lake Ilman, Ilmen, by the name mouth of the river called Volkhov. Volkhov. Why was it here that the famous name of Nogo Road was moved to on paper and on the maps, and at the same time, at the time, the name of Volga with it? As it is absolutely clear that Volkhov is slightly distorted version of the name Volga, the answer may differ. However, there is one that appears worthy of serious consideration. Let us turn to the old maps of Moscow drawn by the Western cartographers and travelers of the 1617 CC. There emerges this curious fact, northern Dvina River and its vicinities uh, are rather well depicted on these maps. It is clear that the Western cartographers knew these regions uh, where the Western merchants and trading ships would arrive via northern shipping route quite well. They spent up the Vina River and other rivers of that region, eventually reaching Yaroslav, the major center of that epoch. But Vladimir and Suzdal, Russia, the suburbs of Moscow, and the territories to the south and west of Yaroslav on the whole, Western cartographers had noticeably poorer knowledge of. They had difficulties even with Moscow, the capital of Russia in the 16th century. For instance, on the very map of S. Herberstein, allegedly in the year of 1546, the city of Moscow is not indicated at all. There was written only the name of land, Moscow, Kauya, uh, a city near Moscow River, was drawn, but without a name. The other cities, however, were indicated and named. It proved that the Western cartographers of the 16th century were getting confused about the location of Moscow, the city of Russia. They knew roughly that it was situated somewhere there far away, but they had trouble telling where exactly. That is why they nominally drew a large territory of Moscowia. Inside this territory, they tentatively depicted a town not quite understanding where exactly it was located. The same story was with Vladimir, another old capital Russia horde. Most likely in the epic of the 14th to 16th CC, the Russian horde authorities simply didn't allow the foreigners inside the country further than Yaroslav and the merchant cities along the Volga River. The horde acted in a comprehensible way. Um, you are welcome to come and trade, but you're uh, entrance in the land where the Tsar quarters is situated is either forbidden or highly restricted. 
as the region of the south and west of Yaroslava as Vladimir, Vladimir and Sudel, Russia, the metropolis of the entire empire, these lands were strictly guarded. That is why the Western cartographers had to use the whole, only some vague stories about which towns, rivers, and lakes are situated in the vast metropolis of the empire, which was inaccessible to them. To draw a map based on such con conversations was not simple, of course, so Vladimir and Zuzel's uh, Russia on the map of S. Herberstein and other cartographers were possibly drawn in the quiet of the Europe of European offices based on the snippets of the incidental information. Let's go back to the problem of Nogorod. Let's have a look at the map of S. Herbenstein, figures 83. We can see the Moga Mologa River is shown in, incorrectly instead of the loop of the Western European depicted in the river practically as a straight line starting not far from the Lake Ilmen, uh, following straight towards the Volga River. It is a uh, first rate blunder. In fact, the Molga, uh, Mologa me meanders in a loop, mean beginning the Vladimir and Suzdal, Russia, the flowing into the Volga River a little bit above Yaroslav. At the same time, S. Herberstein says correctly that the Mologa River flows from the land of Veliki Nogorod. That is why the Western merchants and travelers, having arrived to Volga at the mouth of the Mologa near Kolopi Gorod, town of Serbs, understood that going up the Mologa River, they would soon find themselves in the Tsar's quarters of Veliki Nogorod. As Nogorod was not just another town, but an entire region of towns, that is why if you go up the Mologa River, at first you need to move towards the northwest. However, later going up Mologa further, you need to turn south or even east. And as a result, the ship will return to the Yaroslav, the Nogorod land. Thus, the Westerners correctly informed their cartographers that the Tsar's headquarters in Maliki, Nogorod, it was situated upstream with the Mologa River. The only thing left to do was to draw this river on the map. This is where the cartographers were faced with difficulties. They knew for sure that going upstream on Mologa from Volga, the ship would first go northwest, but they had no idea how the river would act further. They were not allowed as far as that. So the cartographers decided to merely continue the line of the river straight to the northwest, the, day, the way it is drawn on the map of Herberstein. Having made this fundamental mistake, the cartographers stretch the Mologa River as far as the Lake Ilman. They erroneously decided that Moga source is located here after they, that they confidently drew here the Tsar's Veliki Nogorod at the riverhead of Mologa. Thus, the analytic royal Nogorod was driven back far to northwest. The Romanov's dynasty was pro-Western not only by blood, but also by their original spirit. That is why the Western chronicles of maps, which replaced either the destroyed or the edited chronicles uh, and map of Mongol Empire, provided the basis uh, to the Romanov geography and history. As we can see on the Western map, Veliki Nogorod is erroneously drawn near the Lake of Ilmen, there was nothing left for the Romanov historians to do but to place here on the ground the geographical Nogorodian names, which they have read from the Russian chronicles. In particular, they had to call a shabby town district with a prison, Veliki Nogorod. This was an isolated place, desolate swamp land, wolves, frogs, snakes, and mosquitoes. The mistake, once firmly consolidated, it acquired an authoritative appearance and overgrew with the other distortions in the 20th century. Moscow archaeologists arrive here in order to even better confirm the chronicles to see the outcome of this activity. See 4v1, chapter 2, 11 to 12. 16. The coat of arms of the Russian Horde Empire of the uh, 16th century. The coat of arms of the Russian Empire has changed over the course of time. It was interesting to see that it looked like the 1617 CC during the epoch of the Horde Empire and immediately after its breakup of the 17th century, according to four old depictions arrived in the imperial emblem of the 16th to 17th CC. Namely, number one, the state seal of Tsar Ivan the Terrible, 
ION Grand Z here surrounding the two headed eagle on the face side of the seal, there are 12 emblem seals. Uh, eight. Number two, the depiction of the coat of arms of the throne of Mikhail Fedorovich. Number three, the coat of arms on the silver plate of the Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich. Number four, the depiction of the coat of arms of the empire from the diary of Koreb, Joan Giorgio Korb, Divin, uh, Din, Dinivki, Nick, Divin, Nick, uh, Pushetstovia, V, Moscovio, the diary of the travel, travel to Moscovy, uh, 1698 to 1699, who in 1698 to 1699 accompanied the Austrian, Austrian ambassador of the Habsburgs, sent to Moscow. Here are already depicted the 32 coat of arms of the Tsardom, not including the Moscow coat of arms. Let's look at the national coat of arms of the Horde Empire of the 16th century. It is considered to be the earliest of the four previously mentioned. The 12 regions, kingdoms surrounding the two-headed eagle on the emblem are intriguing. They are listed in the inscription. The Grand Sovereign Tsar and Grand Prince of all Russia, Ivan Vasilovich, Tsar of Vladimir, uh, Grand Prince of Moscow, the Novgorod Novo Tsar Kazan, Tsar of Astrakhan, Sovereign of Pliskov, Grand Prince of Smilinsk, uh, Grand Prince of Tver, Grand Prince of Yugra region, Grand Prince of Prim, Grand Prince of Vyaska, Grand Prince of Bulgaria and the other territories, Sovereign and Grand Prince of Novai Gorod, New Town of the Nizovsky Zem Zemli, Nizovsky lands, the Sovereign and Grand Prince of Chernigov, it turns out that the entire empire consists of 12 Tsardom regions reflected in the Bible in the 12 tribes of Israel. It was like exactly the 12 Israeli tribes, files who set off for the conquest of the Promised Land, as it is shown in. Uh, it took place in the 15th century. These 12 tribes originated in Russia and the Ottoman Empire and settled across the world, i.e. in Southern and Western Europe, Africa, Asia, and America. Among the 12 kingdoms, kingdom regions, there were also the indigenous Russian Hordean ones, for example, Veliki Nogorod, which in the coat of arms is rightly combined with the Moscow and Vladimir, for, or for example, the Kazan, Sardam, the Astrakhan kingdom, Smolensk Grand Duchy. Uh, an interesting question arises: Shouldn't there be also, uh, shouldn't there also be the territories of Western and Southern Europe as well as Constantinople, conquered by the Ottomans, comprising the Mongol Empire, uh, i.e., Asia Minor, Egypt, and other neighboring countries? Where are they in the coat of arms of Russian Horde Empire of the 16th century? Could it be that we are stumbled ac across a contradiction? No, it turns out that everything is fine. 17. 12 Tsardom tribes of the Russian coat of arms of the 16th century on the map of Europe. In 4v2, chapter 2, we were able to establish which territories of empire corresponded with the emblem specified in the state seal of the 16th century. We will mark these places on the map of Europe, uh, where the capital of the Tsardom reigns uh, indicate on the side uh, on the face side of the seal were situated. The dots of the figures in both uh, in bold represent the 12 Zardom tribe positioned around the 12-headed eagle. One, Veliki Nogorod, including the Vladimir and Moscow, Vladimir and Suzdal, Russia. Two, Zardom of Z Z Zazan. Three, Astrakhan, Zardom. Three, Plukov, Republic, Prussia, Central and North uh, Af uh, Germany. Five, Grand Principality of Smolensk. Six, the Principality of Great Perm, uh, Tiberian Principality with its capital in Zagrad in the Bosphorus. Seven, Grand Principality of Yugra, equals Hungary. Eight, the Principality of Great Perm, German, Austrian. Nine, Grand Principality of Vladyatka, Spanish Vatican. 10. Grand Principality of Bulgaria. 11. Grand Principality of Nizovie or Nizogorodskoye Principality. 12. Grand Principality of Chernigov. 
In figure 87, you can see that the biblical kingdom's tribes are arranged in groups, except for the last two tribes added to the coat of arms after the words and the other territories. First group, the Zardam along the Volga River, Veliki, Nogorod, Kazan, Astrakhan. Number two, second group, in West Russia, Pleskov, Pleskov, Pleskov or Prussia, Smolensk, White Russia, Bel, Belia, Rus, or Blue Russia, Blue Rus. Three is West and uh, South Europe, Zagrad, Hungary, Austria, Spain, Italy, and Bulgaria. Fourth group, the two more Russian princedom, princedoms, uh, Nizhny, Novgorod, and Chernigov. Thus, the coat of arms of Russia horde of the 16th century there is depicted a significant part of the empire, but not all of it. Some of the northern provinces were not included. Sweden, for example, distant eastern lands, Japan, for example, and distant western territories, England, for example. The overseas colonies in America also were not included. However, England and Sweden are included in other Russian emblems. In figure 86, we see Russian emblems of the Romanov epoch of the end of the 17th century. On the eagle's wings, from left to right, there are coats of arms of Kiev, Novgorod, Astrakhan, Moscow, Siberia, Kazan, Vladimir, including the Volvo clockwise from the top of the coat of arms, Pliskovsky, Tversky, Podolsky, uh, Permsky, Bogarsky, Chernikovsky, Polotsky, Yaroslavsky, Udorsky, Kandysky, Mstislavsky, uh, Ivertsky, Kabardinsky of Charkov and Gardsky territories, Kartatsinsky, Svitsky, uh, Vitetsky, Obdorsky, Belozorsky, Rostovsky, Razyansky, Novgorod, Nizovsky, Yadsky, Yugorsky, Volyensky, Smolensky. Here, the number of the coat of arms is significantly greater than the Mongol emblem of the 16th century. They appear mysterious Zardums, such as Yudorsky, Kandins. Kandinsky, the uh, Obdorsky, besides the Principdom of Iversky and Kartelzinsky are named. One of them, Kart Kartelzinsky, Zardom, is probable, possibly Georgia, in which case Iver Zardom is Spain. We don't mean to say that at the end of the 17th century, Spain still belonged to Russia, a uh, Russian empire. The Romanovs quite simply took the old Hordian coat of arms, where, among other names, were named in distant Tsardoms, which used to belong to uh, Russia horde of the 15th to the 16th CC. The Mongol emblem was more detailed than the one we had discussed earlier. That is why we can see here such well-known Tsardoms as Svetsky, Swiss Sweden. It is followed by Ivertsky, Spain, then there is Yugorsky and Zardom, Hungary, then Bulgarian, and lastly there is Permsky, Austrian, Zardom. Let's go back to the three new, at first glance, unclear names of the Mongol emblem, Yudorsky, Kandinsky, and Obdorsky, Princedom, as we show in the answer is as follows, the mysterious Udorsky, Prince of the Mongolian land on the border of the present-day Germany and Poland, where the river order follow, flows. The British Isles, England, or the Isle of the Crete are named as Kanti, Kantitsky Island on the coat of arms of Russia Horde. Mysterious Obdora is a name and maybe even the entire territory in uh, Spain or in France, and it could also possibly be in France if we remember that France and France are just uh, the two versions of the, of the same name. Latin C would read as T-S or T. 18. On the history of England. 
As we have shown in 4v2, the ancient chronicles in existence today describe the Zargrad Zardom of the 12 to the 15 CC and the Horde Empire of the uh, 14 to the 16 CC. The historians erroneously date these chronicles as deep antiquity earlier than the 12th century. Roughly speaking, the ancient English chronicles are the Romaic and Mongol chronicles transferred to the England during the conquest by the Horde and interweaved into the insular English history. The actual written history of England, which provides the account accounts of events specifically on this island, begins only in the 11th century. There are very few fragments of the 11th to the 13th century which survive. Then on top, there was applied a layer of the events telling us about Zagrad and Great Empire. The combination of the insular English and Romaic Mongolian layers gave us the modern textbook of the history of the English of the uh, 11th to the 16th CC. The history of England as we know it today, which truly reflects the native of English insular events only begins with the 16th to the 17th CC, uh, unalloyed with the Zagrad or Mongolian events, roughly speaking, beginning with the 16th, 17th CC. The Scaligerian version of history of England is more or less correct. In the 13th century, the waves of the Crusades overwhelm Romia. The Crusader states emerge here. Both the local population and the Crusaders get mixed up in them. Central life flourishes. The chronicles are written. At the beginning of the 14th century, the Mongol conquest takes place. Then in 1453, under the attack of the Ottomans who came from Russia horde, Constantinople fell. Byzantium is destroyed. Crowds of its people leave the country. Many rich people, intellectuals, and aristocrats leave for Europe, including for the island of England. These fugitives of the 14th to the 15th CC take them with them, the Zagraj Chronicles, as a memory uh, of the true history of Romia and Horde. In the 14th century, a gigantic horde empire emerges. On the island of England appears another of its provinces with its governors subordin subordinate to Russia and the Ottoman Empire. The chronicles which are written during this time on the island reflect not so much the local events as the life of the whole empire and its hordeum metropoli. Some time passes, they start writing their own history on the island of England and in the uh, 16 to the 17 CC, the new history of ancient England is created. This is a part of a global reformation of old chronicles are being rewritten in England as well. A lot of the true history of the 14 to the 16 CC has been forgotten. The English historians of the 16th to 17 CC uh, declared the old Romaic and Hordean Ottomania uh, chronicles edited by them to be the documents of the allegedly insular English history. They make them the basis for the ancient history of the British Isles, big chunks of history of Romia and the Mongol Empire, which unfolded in the vast territories of Eurasia, are transferred on paper to the comparatively small British Isles and their surroundings. Many major events inevitably became become smaller, as if shrunk in size. The Hordean Tsar and the Empire turn under the quill of English editors into their local island rulers. The Great Empire disappears from the pages of the edited chronicles, and those accounts which they didn't succeed in destroying are moved to the past with the aid of the false chronology, transforming them into the most ancient myths. As a result of the 1617 CC, there emerges emerged the in English chronicles in which in the styles of the Anglo-Saxon chronicle. The history of the Britons by Ninius etc. Soon, this fresh version of the ancient English history solidifies like a monument. In the 19th to the 20th CC, it becomes only slightly clarified and lacquered over. And today, when discovering with the aid of mathematical methods astonishing duplicates inside the English textbooks, we begin to understand that the actual English history is considerably shorter. It is possible that the reformers moved the stolen treasury of the empire to England. They didn't want to take a chance of keeping it in Europe, wary of the re restoration of the Russia horde. At first, they tried to create a new metropoly in Vienna, Austria, by uh, instilling, installing their string puppets there under the pompous name of the Habsburg. Nothing came of it. The empire was short-lived. That is why the Hordean money was taken as far away as possible to the distant English Isle.
There, where, under Ivan the Terrible, Elena Voloshenka, Esther, Mary Stuart, was exiled to and executed, having seized the vast treasures of the Horde, the English rebels uh, acquired influence and created the English Empire, which existed for some time.